two, one, and go. Wait, and go. Howdy, folks. Welcome. Welcome to our Saturday night. We missed a week. Apologize. We had something come up last week. So tonight's topic is all things sharpening, but I think focusing on saws. And I'll introduce everybody as time goes, but we'll start right away. Give me one frick, please. Sorry, I forgot to bring them up. Ah. Luther just sent them to me. Actually, right. no, Luther didn't send them to me. Well, anyway, I'll tell you what we're doing. This is our, uh, we do this every second Saturday night, usually, in support of our Purple Heart Project, which the very good news is our first class, which will be technically our second, but for the most part, our first class has opened up to the world since the fall of 2019. It's taking place on May 15th, Jake, is that the date? May 15th, it's a full class. We have five uh, combat wounded vets coming from the United States, two Canadians coming from Alberta, and the civilians are coming from all over. And the reason why we do this fundraiser for the vets, we cover their airfare, their hotel, their meals. Each vet goes home with somewhere between four and five thousand dollars worth of premium hand tools. And thanks to the Bench Brigade, uh, Jack Lane down in Texas, and Chris Husky and Jim Rossetti in Moncton, New Brunswick, every v uh, vet will have a bench delivered to their home so they can set up their own little shop at home. And why do we do that? Well, because they deserve it. But we've also come to find out that things like hand tool woodworking are very therapeutic for people suffering from traumatic brain injuries and PTSD. So we've been doing, we started this program in November of 2016. This is, this will be class number 14, Jake. I think so. This will be class number 14. We've had 95 combat wounded vets come through our program from three countries, Canada, United States, and Australia. We've had three female combat wounded vets in that group. And we have had double that had we not, we actually would have had more than that because we bumped it up. Now we do 40, we bring in 42 each year. So we do one class a month starting in May, going through to October. And Super Dave, David Benson, combat wounded vet himself, and Colonel, retired Colonel Luther Sheely are the uh, are two uh, point men for that program. And they come, each one of those two gentlemen come for three of the classes as our assistant. Coming in May will be Danny Bell. He's, uh, Danny was in our class a few years ago. We always bring back one wounded vet from a previous class to come in and be our assistant for the week. And uh, Danny's gonna be the guy. Danny retired as a uh, Chinook helicopter pilot just a year or so ago. Rick, how are we now? Yep. All, All right, right, fire away. All right. <clears throat> First question comes from Peter Soderblom in Stockholm, Sweden. Hey, Peter, you're up late. He says, can you go through uh, the kind of files that you use? Yeah, well, that's actually, uh, that is a tough, what do I say? That's the problem we're having, finding good files. So if Jake's in tight, you want your file, it's a, for most of the saws that we use, we use either a four inch or a five inch double extra slim tapered file, but they need to be sharp right here. And uh, we just, we've been trying to source them. Jake had some come from Grobe, which is a name we'd always trusted. And they're really wide right here. So here's what happens. <coughs> you want, you want your tooth pattern to look like this. It's a little off. But when your file, and, and your file of course sits in there like that, and it's, it should be an equilateral triangle. Instead, we're seeing files that look more like this. So they tend to almost give you this, which is not what you want. So I can't even recommend one to you yet. Have we got more on the way? From more on the way, yeah. Okay, apparently we found another source. What country? 
Brazil? Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland? That hopefully are going to be good. And if they are, we'll <coughs> stock them and be able to provide them to you. But we haven't had much luck. You've got to remember, how many saw filers, how many people still file saws professionally? I don't know if there's any, because it's a thing of the past. But typically for doing uh, any of my saws, dovetail saws, tenon saws, you're going to use a four or five inch double extra slim tapered file. Now, if you're having to joint your saw, meaning your teeth have, after multiple sharpenings, your teeth are no longer straight. I was thinking I gotta go get braces. Your teeth are no longer, the tops are no longer uniform. So you've, you've filed multiple times and now you've got little tooth, big tooth, little tooth, big tooth. So then you gotta go in with a, with a uh, this is a, uh, a single cut mill bastard file and you go in and you would joint that so that you have all the teeth at the same height. Now that would result in some teeth, some teeth would be sharp, some teeth would have big wide flats, some would have a little less flats and then you'd have to start all over and get them all at the same height. So that's when I would use a file like that. I'd take the handle off so I can, I can lay it I can join, run that all the way across. Obviously, couldn't do that with the handle on there. And that's about it. Oh, and I, there, there's, if you're wondering about these, these are all saw sets, mostly antique. This is a new one. Next, Frick. <clears throat> yep, next one comes from uh, Buck. <clears throat> do we ever see Troy? Pardon? His name is Buck, and he's from Welcome. Buck. Yep. Uncle? Well, Uncle Buck, yep. Welcome Creek. Queensland, Australia. One of my favorite characters. He's from Queensland, Australia? Yes. So it's tomorrow morning. Most likely it's uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, 10 after. All right, his question set is, I have a Cosman three-quarter dovetail saw. What is the recommended file and technique to sharpen it? I have never sharpened any saw before. Well, it's actually really easy, believe it or not. So I'm going to give you some recommendations. Shoot. I meant to bring that book, Tay Frid's book down. Um, Ken. Yeah. Never mind, because I have no idea where to tell you. Is it in your bookcase? No, I took it out. So, 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 the first thing you're going to need is a vise. And I actually have two antique vices. We couldn't find them, but it doesn't matter anyway because no sense showing it to you. Where did we do this? Where did we make this? On the online workshop or YouTube? YouTube. We did. Mm -hmm. So we have a YouTube video that we did showing you how to make this. And this is, uh, this is modeled after one that Tay Frid made. So Tay Frid, <coughs> spelled T-A-G-E, last name F-R-I-D, wrote a series of three books. Taunton Press published them. And the one on joinery shows you how to make this. Uh, it's really simple. It has a piece of piano hinge, two pieces of plywood. Now, I made this a little more complicated. Piece of piano hinge, two pieces of Baltic birch plywood. And I did the cutout in here, and you'll see why when we put the saw in. A couple strips of hardwood, a couple strips of here. Now, these strips are so that when you put it in the vise like that, it automatically sits level if your bench top is and then you're going you need uh, if there's a if there is a uh, I was going to say key but I hate using that word all the time there's something you got to make sure and that is that your saw blade is held securely in the vise in other words it's going to vibrate terribly So you clamp that in there. And sometimes you gotta come in and put another clamp on there, but you don't want it to vibrate. And my teeth are just, they're sticking up less than an eighth of an inch above that line. Now these are 22 teeth per inch, so they're small. So that's where I would get a four inch if I had it, and I haven't got one here. And this is, and the smaller they are, the more important it is that that file be really good. Now, 
this is a tip that I learned from somebody, and I can't remember who, so I apologize for not being Try able to this. give credit. What? Try this. If you're doing this for the first time, it pays to go in and paint your teeth with a Sharpie. And the reason is, especially on these little tiny teeth, it's real easy to lose track of where you are. And you don't want to skip a tooth and you don't want to hit a tooth twice, because if you do, then you're going to mess it up. Now, nice thing about a dovetail saw is that it's a rip tooth. And the rip tooth is shaped in such a way that it, the cutting part of the tooth is filed perpendicular to the run of the blade. So the blade is this way, then your file is going to be going across like that, across. And that's pretty easy to do by, by eye. Now, these teeth on this particular saw, so this is my newest chance to do a commercial. This is my second newest saw. And um, on a traditional dovetail saw, I'll pull one out of here. We could use this one, even though it's a little more of a, no, it's still class as a dovetail saw. On a small dovetail saw like this, you would file the teeth and the face with each stroke, I'm cutting myself, with each stroke of the file, you're filing the face of one tooth and the back of the other. So the cutting edge, remember, consists, just like on a plane blade, consists of two surfaces the back and the bevel, and you have to do the same to both in order for it to, be, to work properly. So with, with, each, with, with each stroke, you're filing this face, I can't point the very well, can you get in tight? Okay. You're filing this face and the back of the opposite one. Now, I point that out because on my dovetail saw, the first two inches have little tiny teeth, you see them, they're small, and these teeth have a zero degree cutting face. So if you were to put a square on the face of this tooth, that's the part that actually digs into the wood, it's standing square like that. But these ones, to make it easier to start, the whole purpose of having, the whole purpose of having, uh, let's go over here. It's kind of an extended lesson, but I, find that if you understand what you're doing, it's a lot easier to do it. Let me just buzz that off real quick. Don't let me forget to do introductions tonight. And call out Troy for not showing up. Okay. So... When you're cutting, those big teeth are very aggressive. So that zero degree cutting angle makes it, it's gonna cut fast and you want speed. But when you're trying to get started, you need to have precision. So I need to be able to start. If I had a line on there, which I should put, because it'll make it a little bit easier to explain this. So there's my line. And this is the waist side. So I need to be able to start that saw right beside that line, not taking any of the line off, and hopefully not leaving a bunch of wood on this side of the line. If I start back here with the regular teeth, they have a tendency, I'll go over here, they have a tendency to bite and grab, and it requires you to push harder to get it started. And in pushing harder, you lose some of that control. So by going with the smaller teeth and backing that cutting face off about 30 degrees, then there's very little resistance. And that allows you to go in and very carefully get that started. And then you follow up with the big teeth and you get a nice fast, fast cut and a very accurate cut. So, <coughs> you asked about this saw. Because these, this saw is so small, what we did is we took the first inch and a half, and they're all the same size, they're all 22 teeth per inch. That means if you were to take a, a measuring device and measure out and count how many teeth are in one inch, 
there would be 22 points in every inch. That's pretty small. But what we did in the first inch and a half is we backed that fake cutting face off. These are zero degrees. These are sitting back at about 25, 30 degrees. So again, it makes it a little bit easier to get it started. I'm not gonna sharpen this. I'm not gonna do this one because it doesn't need to be. It's brand new. But what I would do, if you're gonna avoid those, you probably need to cut these at some point because you don't want them. If you just sharpen from here back, these are gonna be sticking up higher than these. So you've gotta go in and do those as well. And what you would do is you would just adjust your, the angle of your file See, this is, the, this is my cutting face here. You can adjust the angle of your file to match that gullet. But when I'm back here doing these, where's my little square? Did I leave it over there? Mm -hmm. now, I'm glad you said you're new because I'll give you some other little tip tips. So take a piece of a popsicle stick And a drill. This is my Yankee drill. What size is going to match that? Quartering. Put right there. This is a little bit bigger than what I wanted, but go right about in the middle. So I can come over here and do this. Set that, oh, it's this side. Set that face of the file on there like so. So I know where it is. Stick this on the end. I made that too big, almost. Now I'm going to adjust that so that when this is square, this popsicle stick is going to be level. Now when I start filing, I can tell if I'm tipping. Once you do this a little after a while, I just hold my finger where I need it and I can tell. And it's just a matter of, depending on how bad they are, it's a matter of a stroke. And what I do is I drag it back in the same gullet and people will tell you that ruins your file. Well, you know what? I'd rather ruin my file than my saw because it, I find it very difficult, even with our good eyes on, to make that pass, come up, come back and set down in the next one. It's easier to make the pass, drag it back, feel it rise up and over and down into the next gullet and make the pass and drag it back and up and over and down into the next gullet and make work your way all the way down. And uh, it really is quite easy. It's, it's not uh, difficult. I wouldn't recommend starting on a saw that big. Small. I might get one uh, that small, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> I would get something a little bit bigger and uh, work on it. Even this one is with a 15 teeth per inch. They should probably buy an antique. Yeah, uh, or just an old hardware <coughs> one. Well, that's maybe something cheap. An expensive cheap. one. So you're gonna go in there. Again, if you want to, you can mark it with, with a Sharpie so that you can see where you're going. And then it's a stroke, and come back, and over, and a stroke, and back, and over, stroke. And you, you want to, hopefully you'll be able to tell that you're square this way. It's, it's not critical. If you're off a degree or two, I don't think it's going to make any difference. But get an old saw, practice on it. And this is a great book, but it's no longer, it hasn't been in print in a long time. I don't even know if you'll be able to find one. Uh, this was Ian Kirby's second book. I think he only he had planned to make do several, but I think he only got two done. This one's called Down to a Line, and this gives you. I find his drawings are really easy to follow, and I like his style. But he goes through and uh, talks about um, everything you need to know about sharpening your own saw. Great resource, but hard to find. 
and Tom Law did a video. It's on DVD now, and I'm sure you can find it somewhere, and it's called Saw Sharpening. Tom Law has since passed away, but uh, I think his video was great in explaining this process as well. All right. Super Dave says that that was his idea, the Sharpie idea. Oh, was he it? He calls it the old Super Dave Sharpie trick. Yeah, the old... <laughs> okay. Well, we won't argue with Super Dave. The only time Super Dave and Sharp was ever used in the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Frick, do you want to comment on Sharp? No. No? Okay, next. Uh, next one comes from Tyson Underwood in Mill Valley, California. Hey, Tyson. He asks, is it worth sharpening a panel saw? Is it worth sharpening a panel saw? Yep. Well, <clears throat> uh, the, most of the saws that you buy today are, uh, I think they call it induction hardened. You won't be able to sharpen them because it, they're harder than the file. They're designed to be discarded. Uh, if it's a decent saw, sure, sure it is. If you've never done it before, I don't think it's fair to say that you can't ruin it because you can certainly make a mess of it. Um, Boy, I don't even know where you where to tell you to send it. I don't. I, I haven't got a clue. Uh, we used to have a guy here that, would, that was still doing them, but he's since sold his business just a couple of years ago, and uh, I don't know the people that bought it, so I don't. Uh, I don't think there's. I can't make that recommendation, but I used to have people send their saws from all over North America to Danny. But yes, it's worth it. It's worth learning. Go get an old flea market special and practice on that until you get it right. There's lots of, lots of resources, There's video, all kinds of YouTube videos and everything on, on sharpening saws. And hopefully, in not too distant future, we'll be able to provide you with some good files. But most of what you're going to buy are, are not very good. And it's kind of sad, but that's what happened to the dinosaur. Next, Frick. Actually, uh, let me introduce who we have here tonight. Ken Anthony's here. Ken is our manager. Uh, you want to show Ken? Wake him up. <laughs> Ken manages the production in the shop, all the stuff that gets built here. And Ken is Angie's cousin. He was out there today visiting her. Angie and her sister Lynn, they do all the packaging of our Purple Heart t-shirts. Big shout out to Angie. I just found out that her training is all done. She's ready to go to work. So she needs to know that we're waiting for her. Her locker's still out there, empty, ready for her? Ready yep. Angie is uh, about the same age as Ken, but an illness has kept her confined to her bed for the last, how long, Ken? Several years. Several years. But she's getting better. We also have Moose here. Moose is the uh, purveyor of the dead cat sweater. Shoot, we don't even have one on display. No, they're Where'd all... Where'd that go? Sold. <laughs> had to raid your inventory. For oh, days. great. That was out. Oh, you, oh, you <laughs> took it. <laughs> no. The Gina had Oh, Gina it. shipped it. She needed a small onion. Well, everybody, everybody knows that about the dead cat sweater, and, and Moose, is, uh, uh, Moose, Moose helps us out with those, as well as the uh, Purple Heart golf shirts over here and the little happy sweaters that we had do we have any of those left oh, yeah. mickey was in here wearing his the other day he loves it visit his web visit his website he and his wife pat patsecretgarden.com you see what i mean um he owns a tourist related business here in the city of st john which is the inc oldest incorporated city in canada we have frick behind the big green globe we have jake behind the camera and our friend troy has gone missing. We don't know what happened to him. And thank you to my, uh, my wife and whoever else helped out in the kitchen tonight. They fed us a lovely meal. All right, Frick, next. All right, next one comes from Ben in Spokane, Washington. Ben? Ben, yep. Uh, I've been to Spokane numerous times. He says, when and how often do you replace your saw file? Uh, well, I used to have to, I used to uh, file uh, when we, uh, oh, long story, never mind. When it doesn't cut anymore is the, is the uh, smart aleck answer. But 
you'll tell you when a sharp and a file is sharp. Actually, you know what? That's are we on the other camera? The light doesn't work anymore. You never paid attention to it. So we I never paid attention to it. So <laughs> the reason I say that's a good question is because I frequently end up somewhere and I'll uh, demonstrating or something, and I'll ask somebody for a file, and they'll give me a file that does not cut. You can tell when it's sharp and when it's new because it bites and it cuts effortlessly. And when it stops doing that, that's the time to replace it. They're not resharpenable. And uh, same with your saw files. So I, don't, I can't tell you how many saws you're gonna do, but I used to be able to get a dozen or more, easily a dozen or more saws on a single file. And I'm even supposedly dulling them prematurely by dragging them back. But as I said, I'd rather ruin a seven or eight dollar file than mess up my $250 saw. Guys, so. There's a guy on here that says that he, he saw a video of a man who tested the method. Of going Ken, they, they can't hear you. Oh. Ken, a little bit. Oh, can you? Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Ken. Sorry. Michael Dodo, Dodo said there was an awesome video of a man who tested the myth of not dragging the file backwards. He totally debunked it and found there is no excess wear to the file's ability to cut after 10,000 file strokes. Awesome. <laughs> I don't uh, I love it when I can throw something back at them. That's wonderful. Thank you for that tidbit. Next, Rick. Okay. Uh, next one comes from... Uh, Notice I always said, they say. I didn't believe it either. I'm with you. Uh, whoops, wrong camera. What, uh, this comes from... Jury Rolf in Germany. Jerry? Jury. J Jury, J-U-R-Y? J-U-R-I. J-U-R, Jury Rolf in Germany. Yep. Good lighting is key for me. What light do you use when sharpening? Uh, well, first of all, I don't know how, I mean, I, I'm, I'll be 61 in July, and uh, I don't think my eyes are any, nor any worse than anybody else's, but I just find it terribly difficult to see that small stuff. So I, I really like these, and I think they're critical. These are made by, these, uh, the brand name on this is, I, I need them to see it, Optivisor, Optivisor, Optivisor. And um, the only reason I like them is because they're light enough, you don't even know they're on there, it feels no heavier than my hat. It doesn't have much of a system for holding these lenses in, but the lenses come three, four, five, I, I like three, and that's a diopter, I believe, and they just pop out. Sometimes they pop out at the most inopportune time, but I, I couldn't do anything without these when it comes to that. As far as what, what uh, lamp I use, well, we actually carry these now because there was a demand for them. So this is a, uh, you can do whatever bulb you want in there, but I like this because it'll reach, I mean, I can cover half of my bench. I made mine so that this moves, and this is pretty heavy. What we do to make this last a little bit longer, the, um, as you buy the lamp, shoot Jake, mine's not, doesn't have one in. What are you pointing at? Oh, move over here, because they can't see me? Here. So this is the weak, you can see it, this is the weak link on this lamp. And um, we go in and we put a steel rod in there and then we, uh, we drill it right here and put in another nut and bolt. And we turn this mushroom. And the idea with the mushroom is, instead of, instead of this little half inch shaft moving in a half inch hole on the edge of your bench, which gets all worn out and ugly, with that mushroom on there, the lamp does not turn in the mushroom. The mushroom turns in that larger diameter hole and it lasts so much longer. So that's what I use. They're on our website if you want one. Comes with the mushroom and everything you need. Just drill a hole in your bench, several, you know, have three or four holes, and then you can position it anywhere you want. So I, 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 you often don't see me using it on camera because it messes up, it messes up Jake's, what, how do I say that? Lighting. Jake's lighting, but when I'm working by myself, I use it all the time. It's so much easier. You can do it when you see it. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from Chuck Waddell in Florida. Hi, Chuck. That sounds warm, Florida. Can I use a file from a big box store to sharpen my saw? 
Um, don't know. I told you what to look for. You want a file that has nice, sharp corners. And if it doesn't, then you're going to make a mess of, your, of the bottom of your gullet. So I can't answer that question because I have no idea where they're getting theirs, theirs but I don't imagine it's going to be... Uh, if we're having a hard time from the suppliers that we use finding a good one, I don't know that they're going to find one or they're going to have access to the better ones. I just want to, I want to show you something while we're on the topic of saws. So we did this in our online workshop several years ago. And this is a portable saw bench. And if you're going to be using hand saws to break down your lumber, and what I mean by that is when you've got a 10-foot board that you've brought from the uh, lumber yard, you've got to cut it down into manageable pieces. So this was, um, we've got the idea for this off a piece of campaign furniture. So campaign furniture, my understanding was that that was military furniture that was designed to be very compact so that the colonels could have their little portable office. Well, this, I saw a, a desk and I just took, stole some ideas from it and came up with this. This is all done by hand, by the way. So that little tab moves and then that one goes down there. This one goes up here. Now we made all this, so that was a, we just took a, a, a bolt and heated it up and smacked it with a hammer to turn that into a wing nut. And then there's a captured nut over here. So you just tighten that up. And there's your, there's your saw bench. And the reason I have that V there is if you're cutting small pieces, it's nice to be able to hold it securely. That survived a couple of classes. I don't think it got hit more than a few times, or much more than a few times. And it's just the right height, and you can use your knee to hold the piece you're working on, as you saw. Thought I'd show you that. Next, Frick. Um. Oh, by the way, what did I forget to mention? Oh, yes, yeah, so the, what we do, I make myself available to answer questions for you happily. And if you would like to participate in our Purple Heart Project uh, by supporting us, by providing um, a financial contribution to help us in purchasing what the things we have to purchase for the vets, you're welcome to do that. If you go to our website, because we don't charge any fees like other services do, and if you go to our website, robcosman.com, in the top left-hand corner, say, it'll say Purple Heart Project. And in the drop-down menu, it says, how can I help? And there's all kinds of donations amounts in there that you can, you can uh, contribute and be part of this. So for every $1,000 we, we raise, we give away, we make a draw at the end of the night. Is, has that gone up numerous times to enter for the draw? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just enter. It doesn't cost anything to enter. You don't have to make a donation to enter, as nice as that would be. But we give away, and, and we, I'll tell you a little bit more as we go, but I'll, I'll introduce where the prizes come from. You'll be impressed. Go ahead, Frick. Uh, well, we should point out that what? airfare's gone up. Oh, yeah. So Luther just purchased all of the plane tickets for the seven vets that are coming in May. And what did he say? The average most expensive was eighteen hundred. And that guy was coming from Nebraska. Nebraska. Wow. Uh, I think he said. Did he say the average price was three hundred dollars more than what the last time we did it? I don't know, but the average was around a grand. Yeah. So when when we were teach when we taught in two thousand nineteen, we off most of the flights were under five hundred, and now they're closer to a thousand. But hey, it's just money. I'm sure there's, uh, there's fuel surcharges involved in that. Okay, Frick, next. Okay, this one comes from, um, let's see. This one comes from Jim McCoy in Buffalo, Wyoming. Hi, Jim. He says, I what didn't know there was a buffalo in Wyoming. I know there's buffalo in Wyoming. I just didn't know there was a buffalo. YW, that's Wyoming, right? YW is Wyoming. Okay, what is the right amount More of... More antelope than people. YW. Hmm? Or W. W. Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. meant to say. He's... 
I'm a dyslexic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's well, taxic. What is the right amount of flame for cross-cutting both soft and hard wood? Would it be better to have a saw set up for each if I can afford it? Uh, so the flame refers to the angle across the face of the tooth. So what he's talking about, remember I said, I said, uh, the, I said we, a dovetail saw or any of a rip saw typically is perpendicular here. You can adjust that a little bit, but you know what? This is like... Um, uh, you know, those are, there are people that are so hung up on taper ground saws. That's going to be too long of an explanation. We've got time. I'll back, up. I'll back up a little bit. Um, I, don't think the, I don't think what you're asking is warranted. I don't think you're going to see any great improvement. Um, it would be like literally splitting hairs. And I have not experimented with that, but if I cut a dovetail in pine, if I cut a dovetail in oak, cherry, or walnut, I use the same saw for all of them, and I'm not left wanting, thinking, oh, my, it could be easier. No, it works fine. So uh, sometimes we have a tendency to make a whole lot of noise about something that really is insignificant, and I'm going to throw my vote in that, that t worrying about the fleam on your saw is somewhat insignificant, particularly when it comes to uh, joinery saws, tenon saws, dovetail. So that yeah, I'm just giving you my opinion. Somebody else may may uh, give you a completely different viewpoint, but I can only give you mine. Next, Rick. Okay, next one comes from. Um, um, Which, by the way, just as a, a I'm just gonna, I'm going to tell them this: we we are working on being able to provide panel saws. Hand saws. I'm not sure how long, but it's our, it's our current saw project. And uh, our most recent, we just released this one a couple weeks ago. This is our, this is our three quarter cross cut. So this is a small cross cut saw, same frame as the uh, three quarter dovetail. It has 22 teeth per inch. These are cross cut teeth. It cuts lovely and small. It has a thir uh, third, uh, pardon me, a 15 thou blade with two thou set per side, so a kerf of 19 thou. And because it's nice and small, you can get in and get a tremendous amount of control. The farther away the tooth line is from the heavy brass back, the more wobbly it tends to be, particularly for somebody who doesn't do this every day. So bear that in mind. And rarely do you ever need even that much depth of cut, but if I only gave you a quarter of an inch, you wouldn't get too many sharpenings and you'd be out of, out of blade. What was the question? <coughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Kevern in Cornwall. Hi, Jonathan. Cornwall on Doesn't say. UK? Doesn't say. There's a Cornwall, Ontario, but it's... Right. So he says he recently purchased a second-hand 22-inch 10 TPI ripsaw in good condition. Is it possible to reshape and file to a cross-cut form? And if so, how do I do it? Mm. Okay, read it again for me, please. Okay, so he purchased a second-hand 22-inch 10 TPI a ripsaw. 22 inch, not how many TPI? 10. 10. 10, yeah. It's in good condition. Hold on, hold on, hold on. 22 inch. Well, that's longer 20, that. so just a couple of inches longer. It's in good condition. He wants to know if it's possible to reshape and file it to a crosscut. Sure, form. it is. To a crosscut form, and if so, how would you do it? Um. Uh, Gee, that's not a, that's not a two minute answer. Well, how would you do it? Well, assuming you understand what a crosscut tooth looks like versus a rip. So, what, what's the what's the tooth count? Ten. Ten. Yeah, well, that's fine. So this is a rip, and this has uh, seven. seven TPI. So seven teeth or seven points per inch. Um, I actually have this backed off a little bit. So this isn't quite 90 degree, uh, zero degrees. It's backed off just a little bit. Um, and the, the file, it's filed this way. So the file is perpendicular to the blade. So in the cross cut, the file is at about 60 degrees. And uh, I don't remember what the actual angle, the angle is, whereas this one is zero or close to zero. This one's less than that. So that's, a, that's filed at about 60 degrees. So, I mean, they're the same saw, right? 
if you took off the teeth, they're the same saw. So you're just wanting to go in and reshape those teeth. Now, the problem in doing that, if you've never done it before, is, uh, and you see it whenever somebody brings you, and I ever go to a class and somebody's sharpened their own saw, you usually see this. They've really butchered it. You've got a little teeth and three big teeth and then a little tiny tooth, and sometimes they're almost wiped out. So um, I possible. don't know whether you'd be better off in filing all the teeth off and starting over. And Tom Law, in his video, if I remember correctly, what he did is he, he did that, and then he took another saw, and he used that as a guide to start the teeth. But it's just a fair bit of filing. Uh, would I do that? Well, the problem is, I don't know where you're going to get a good saw today because Lee Nelson's not producing them anymore or hasn't for a number of years. Unless you find an antique saw and you're going to have to restore it. We don't have ours ready yet. Um, Mike Wensloff used to make them. I don't know if he is, but I don't think you're... I don't know what if they're producing anything. Bad Axe, I, I think, still makes them, but I, most of these guys... Huh? Three months. Three months, three month waiting list, and that's short. So I guess the dilemma is you either go buy a decent old saw and you learn how to do this, but you can pick them up at flea markets for pretty inexpensively. So go through and try it. And if you, if you mess it up, file them all off and start over. But yeah, it's a multi-step process. So I, I, re I can't, and I haven't done it. I mean, I've gone in and fixed some, but I haven't done that starting from scratch but pick up or get get access to tom law's video i'm pretty sure he goes through and he shows you how to retooth and that's essentially what you're going to be doing is you're retoothing i have uh who gave it to me the saw mm -hmm. sharp the guy oh came, uh, he yeah has, he he's the guy that drove the <clears> Tesla, right? from uh, delaware mm. if you're on speak bob. up bob that sounds familiar yep. he brought me a foley bell saw so old saw, saw sharpener where you could do all of this stuff and i've had a couple guys try to figure out how to use it and i haven't had the time to devote to it but i want to i just just i think it's a just a uh, interesting piece of equipment and i'd like to be able to do that i don't know if it's a service we would ever provide but just my own interest i want to be able to do it next frick okay, next one comes next one comes from shoot i had it here uh, okay, James in Riley, North Carolina. Hey, James. What is the difference between, or what is the difference when sharpening rip cut versus cross cut saws versus narrow PPI saws? What is the difference between sharpening rip cut, cross cut, and narrow? It says PPI, but is it PPI is the same as TPI? Yeah. Okay. PPI is just points per inch, TPI is teeth per inch. I'm trying to figure out why uh, the uh, last part of the question. No, no, it's like all three. Like, what's the difference? Well, that's what I mean. I'm not sure what he means by three unless he's talking about just a small. Well, what, what, what do you mean by narrow PPI? That's what, that's what I don't know. So let's let's just hit what we, do, what we can. So here's your... Why don't you grab the, uh, grab the samples? <clears throat> I don't know where they are. Right there, bottom drawer. I have them? Yeah. Where? Right oh, there. right here. Put them in we the We kept vice. these? Yes, of course we did. Okay. Release. So here's your, here is your rip saw. Other way. Right? And your teeth. So you're going to put your file down in the gullet. And your teeth, that cutting face of your tooth. Remember, as that's going through the wood like this, it's this that's doing the cutting. So that face is going to be filed perpendicular to the blade. So if I put a square on there like that, that would be perpendicular. Okay? And typically... Yeah, use, use that. All right. Bigger, easier to see. Yeah. And typically, this is going to be zero degrees. So as that's... As that's cutting through the wood. What do you mean when you say typically? Well, you can adjust a little bit, but like you said, but your yeah, I, my, I did. If 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 you're having a, so, I offer this sometimes. Oh, if I say that, people are going to ask me for it. No, I've done this before. Some for someone before they were having a hard time. 
uh, inexperienced, new at this, and the saw was grabbing. Well, if your saw is grabbing, I would personally rather have, let's go over here again. I would personally rather have a saw that it cuts really fast. I like that. But if you're cutting in a piece of red oak, that might be just a little bit too aggressive. So what you can do, instead of having that face 90 degrees or zero degrees, I sorry, I keep alternating those. If I back it off a little bit, then it becomes a little less aggressive and it has a tendency to ride up a little bit. So it, you're not having to push or you're not feeling as much resistance as you meet the wood. So depending on your preference, it's always your preference, you may want to have your saw filed in such a way that instead of being like this, it's backed off just a little bit. So the whole thing is just going to tilt this way. And it'll be slower, but it'll be a little easier to push. So when you're sharpening your rip saw, you're filing perpendicular to the run of the blade. Your cross cut, these teeth, if you were to measure that angle, it's about 60 degrees. So they, this is the, this is the best, uh, Jake. Analogy. Where's my? They're oh. eighth inch. <clears throat> yeah. Don't bring it over. I was thinking maybe you sold it. Which wouldn't be out of the question. Unusual. Sells my tools. Here, uh, what do you want, pine? Mm hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm going to show you this because understanding this will help you understand why it's done and how to do it. So here's a piece of uh, northern white pine. And this rip tooth is very much like a chisel, if you think about it. And when that chisel is ripping, cutting parallel, parallel to the wood, it makes a nice, clean cut. Now, if we go over here and we do that same action cutting across the grain, it doesn't make a very clean cut. So a cross cut tooth, instead of cutting that way, it is like this. It has two sharp three-sided points. Grab the other, the wide one. It I'm looking for it. Displays it better. There. No, not that. I got this one. I got it right here. I got it. So this one, these cross-cut teeth. So I've got a three-sided point on this side and a three-sided point on that way. So it's going to end up giving you this. A sharp severed line. Oh, that's not sharp. My goodness. I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't telling you to grab that one. What were you trying to tell me? You have a wider, a wider marking knife. What's up, Moosey? We have two more people to introduce. So tonight we have Megan and little Moosey Brucey. With the cul-de-sac. It's the cul-de-sac, yeah. <laughs> hey. Smile for the camera. All right. Let me do this. So one tooth on one side is going to give you a nice severed cut. Turning this around. And the tooth on the other side is going to give you a nice severed cut. And as you run your saw, the material will get cleaned out in between, but those points severing the line, not going to push my luck, but as those points sever the fibers on either side, you end up with a nice clean cut. So when you file this one, as I mentioned, you're going to be filing 
at about 60 degrees instead of zero. And you're going to go in and you're going to file. You have to file from one side on one tooth, and then you got to go on the other side and file and it's the, the opposite side. the same thing when you're filing the front you're, you're the filing the, When you're filing the top of one, you're filing the back of the other. That's a little more complicated to do. Sawing a, or doing a rip saw is a piece of cake. It's really easy. Everything is quite straightforward. Next, Frick. Did I get all of that question? <clears throat> yep. Um, too chatty. We'll see. Tommy Roberts in Oklahoma. Can you show how to make? Hey, Tommy. A, can you show how to make a quick wooden angle guide for holding the file for saw sharpening? Um, so read that again. Can you show how to make a quick wooden angle guide for holding the file for, for uh, saw sharpening? You just did, didn't you? Yeah, I suppose you did, didn't you? Well, uh, uh, there's a couple of things you can do. So this, this is just a, I mean, I would prefer a popsicle stick because it's lighter. Drill a hole <laughs> in it and stick that in there at whatever angle you want. So the advantage of this is, like winding sticks, because you've got a long piece, it's a lot easier to tell when you're, when you're tipping more to one side than the other. So visually, it's, you can tell, okay, I'm laying at the wrong angle. Now you can also, I saw another one that you could do for when you're doing, when you're filing your, uh, when you're filing your cross cut. And you can cut, you can uh, take a piece of wood and cut a slot, cut a groove in it that'll fit on, uh, fit onto your saw. Let's see if we can do this. And then cut 60 degrees in it? Yeah, Ken. I don't want to get sawdust on your dinner. Yeah, Ken. What are you doing oh. bringing your dinner in here? <laughs> That's Jake. <laughs> yeah. At sixty? Well, it's thirty. Gonna be a bit sloppy, isn't it? Well, it's. Rough. What do you expect for uh, spur of the moment? So you could put that in there, and run that, and use that as a guide. To I would do it more as a visual guide, to uh, help you hold your chisel at the proper angle, and you can just move it along as you're doing it, and it'll. It, look, if you're off one or two degrees, it's not the end of the world. It's still going to cut. And when you're talking about panel saws like this, you're never going to have, this is never, unlike this saw, this is never going to be the last procedure you do to a piece of wood. These are designed to break your lumber down. Get it to the point where you can then take it to your shooting board and square up the end or your plane and straighten the edge. The dovetail saw, the joinery saw, the intent is that that will produce the two surfaces that you're going to join. You don't do anything after it, but not with these. So if it's off a little bit, as long as it cuts and you don't want it to wander, you don't want to be sawing, a rip saw should cut nice and straight. Let's try it. Try it in the vise or try it on the saw bed? Well, I'll try it on the saw horse. On that? Huh? I would like to piece a little bit bigger. Oh, here. Grab that big wide thing. Yeah. So if your set is correct, and by that I mean these teeth are alternately bent. If the first one is bent this way, the next one is bent that way. And they need to be bent the same amount. And bent mean, meaning measured from how much they deviate from the saw plate. So you should be able to make a cut. straight it is. <clears throat> mm. eh. I Ooh, wooed a little bit. 
cut in the middle. That's close. So if I'd have made a, if I'd made a cut in the middle. No, it's, it, well, that, it does have a little more set than I'd like. If you've got too much set, you end up with a kerf that is this wide and your blade has a tendency to wobble. On my dovetail saw, which only gets used on dry, on dry woods that are what I would deem very stable, when that saw is cutting down there, there's no slop. There is no side to side. There's just enough set that allow the blade to pass through the wood. And the result is you get a nice straight cut. Now, let me just try this up here in a little more controlled environment and we'll see how much of a difference we have. Lift it up a bit. No, I'm not gonna go down very far. Now, that's not bad. That's not a whole lot. I can't wiggle that a, a tremendous amount. Turned around this way, and you can kind of appreciate how much there is. If I, I can't do it with this one. I could do it on the end though. If I put it in there like that, there's really, there's no slop. And that's the difference. This one is gonna break down from large pieces to small pieces. This one is going to produce a finished surface. I don't think that was anywhere near what the original question was, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Next, Frick. Okay, next question. Actually, actually it's, well, how's our audience? Uh, 617. Okay, let me, just, uh, let me just give a quick shout out to a couple of people. So, for the last, since Start October, for a pardon? We're switching cameras. Well, uh, yeah, I, I know, able, I know. So what are you gonna do? Well, you're just gonna keep talking and then when, I, when you need to move. Okay. So for the last several months, uh, as a result of a bit of inspiration that came to me, I realized that a lot of these guys that have come to our <coughs> class that uh, we've helped steer their lives a little bit by giving them a hobby, wanted to take it further than that. They wanted to actually run a business. So uh, we started off with four, we now we're down to three, but we meet twice a week via Zoom. And uh, one meeting each week is very structured. It's all about four minds are better than one when it terms, comes, to term, comes to problem solving and brainstorming. And I get as much out of it as they do. Kevin just gave me a great idea uh, last week that was the result, Ken, of the template that I made for Rick for turning the handles. That's Kevin told me about that. Anyway, so Kevin and Jeff and Danny, all three are combat wounded. Jeff is a uh, reti just retired U.S. Navy um, EOD, stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. So from bomb squad to workshop, uh, wood shop is his slogan. And uh, um, Danny was uh, just retired only a year or so ago, and Danny flew Special Forces guys around the world in a uh, Chinook helicopter. That's the big helicopter, troop transport with the, with the big props, one on either end. Or not, they don't call them a prop, it's called a rotor. rotor. <clears throat> And Kevin is a retired um, Army EOD, and he was blown up numerous times. The last one actually put him out of put him out of the Army. So all three of these guys are have businesses that they're getting up and running. Kevin's is Burris B U R A S Woodworking dot com. Je uh, Jeff is O'Connor Woodworking dot com. And Danny's in the middle. Danny's getting close to, to getting his off the ground. So what we do is we buy their merchandise that they make, and we use that as uh, the, our giveaways. I thought, you know, what better way to uh, do two things, promote their business and give you guys some really unique stuff. So I just want to show you what we have. Now, switch. Switch. Yep. So well, Bob Abbott, who uh, was also with us for a while, and Bob does these cutting boards. This is called a tumbling block. And it's a nice, big, heavy cutting board made out of walnut. 
and cherry and maple. And you can only imagine the amount of work that went into that. It makes me dizzy when I look at it, though. And Bob was a retired uh, US Air Force. And Bob got blown up in, uh, in Iraq. So Jeff makes the shave bowls that I'm a huge fan of. And he has uh, a neighbor not too far away that does the uh, shave soap. And this is badger hair. Comes right off his bum. Apparently it's the best spot to get badger hair for your shave brush. This is his uh, Irish kiss stick. So Jeff also served 10 years Chicago police. So you can imagine what this was used for. But this is made out of Coco Bolo. It's got his nice insignia on there and his little cap on the end. I'm not sure where he learned to rap like that. He must have some hockey in his background. Blackhawk. Blackhawk, yes, that's what he would have been. And uh, these are actually made by Jesse Rufiange, who is a Canadian vet that lives in Nova Scotia now. And these are for holding your, your um, cell phones, either sideways or up and down. And as I mentioned, um, Danny is in the process, and we'll have some stuff from Danny. Je um, Kevin does these laser engravings. So these are done on slate. This is uh, uh, 1940, uh, 1944. This would have been, this is Omaha Beach. And this is, uh, I keep forgetting the name of it, I should remember, but this is a famous Canadian battleship. Uh, not, uh, not a battleship, it's a... Um, for, uh, is it, uh, is not a frigate? frigate, maybe a frigate. If it's not a frigate, it's a. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm bad on the navy. This is Mount Sarabachi, uh, Omaha Beach, not oh, Omaha no. Beach. I'm sorry, um, Iwo Jima, and that's actually some sand that came from the beach of Iwo Jima. So tonight, for every thousand dollars donated, we will draw and give away, and it comes with the stands. Uh, those and shave brushes and cutting boards and anyway so big shout out to those guys I would love it if you showed them some love went to their website and next time you have someone to buy a gift for whether it's anniversary or wedding or graduation buy them something that's very unique and support our troops particularly these guys that have given it all and are now living with the side effects or the after effects of combat for the rest of their lives so, thank you. All right, Frick, let's go. All right. Question comes from uh, Daniel O'Connell in Ireland. Hey, Daniel. He says, I have a real problem with setting the set on my saws. Mm -hmm. I own Rob's saws, and I also own some panel saws, but I never know how much set is required. And if I did know how much set is needed, how do I set that number on my saws? Yeah. So... The problem with most saw sets is that they don't go high, they don't, aren't, aren't um, fine enough for the small teeth. Now this one, this one, and I think this comes from Tools for Working Wood mm. in New York, and that's Joel, I can't pronounce Joel's no, last name. No, it's from Georgia. This is? Yeah. Oh, really? Highland Hardware? Highland. Oh, really? I didn't know that. So I'll just show you how this works. This anvil, this part right here, um, if you can see where it starts, it has uh, an angle face, the, the face is ground, and it starts here at the most extreme, and as it moves around, it's less and less and less. So you set it for whatever you want. In other words, the amount of set that you want, and you lock it in place. Now, you'll notice when I show you. So when I squeeze this, there's a plunger. So the, this works kind of a double action. The big plunger comes in first. The big plunger comes in first, and it holds it presses the, uh, or it squeezes the saw plate between those two big surfaces. And then there's a little plunger that comes in at the top and that's designed to be right on the tooth and that pushes the tooth over a measured amount. The measured amount is whatever slope is on that anvil. So you can increase it or decrease it. I find my, 
Well, I'm different because I don't know of anybody that sells a saw with only two thou set. And that's not very much. If you think about that in relative terms, that's half the thickness of a sheet of writing paper. So all of those sets are going, all of those saw sets are going to put more set on there that you, than you want. So what you end up doing is backing some of it off. How do you back it off? Well, the best thing is to get a diamond plate, like so. And I don't want to do this because I don't want to change the saw. And after you've gone through and set it, now this is, this is a really, it's a bit of a pain to do. Because when you set your teeth, you've got to make sure that you're pushing on every other tooth. So you have to determine which, where's this tooth? Is it going that way or is it coming this way? And mark it. So I would go through and I'd put a little dot on every other tooth. And then I would, and then you do the same thing on the other side. And they're small. And then you would go through with your headgear on so that you could see. Swap my headgear for my hat. You would go in there and you would get right on each tooth and you would go all the way down and you would push all of these teeth that way and then you would do the opposite on the other side. But now you're gonna have more set than you want. So now you gotta get rid of some of it. So set up with a piece of wood, set your saw on your stone like this, hold your thumb right there and drag that along the stone. I can do this on a piece of wood. Let's just pretend that this is the uh, we will pretend that this is the <coughs> diamond stone. And the reason I say diamond stone, if you use any other stone, you're gonna dig into it. So you would put it like this and you would drag it once, flip it over and drag that side. And then I would come over and I would make one or two test cuts. Now, what I'm watching for, two things. I don't want it to bind. If, I, if it binds, I took off too much set but I don't want it to be sloppy, nor do I want it to drift to the left or to the right. If it's drifting to the left, I've got too much set on the left side. And because there's no, because there's extra set, the saw wants to follow the path of least resistance. So it's gonna go off like that. And of course, if there's too much set on the right, it's gonna do the same thing. You want it to be balanced. If it were off, if it was drifting to the left, then I would come in and I would drag the left side one time come back and check it. And I would just keep going back and forth until I got the same amount of set on both sides based on the fact that I have a nice straight cut. And then I would reduce it until I got the kind of uh, curve that I was looking for, which if it's, I said, if it's not an, uh, as I said, if there's not enough, it's going to bind. And if it's just too much, like we sawing over here, your saw is wiggling back and forth. So, uh, I, I, I read somewhere, somebody went in and modified one of these. Uh, I'm not sure how that would happen because, well, you know, there is a, uh, I've got an area. I got a good mind to do that. I've got an area that, right about there that doesn't seem to have anything. And if you could go in there and with a file and literally file that, slope that back just the small amount that I'm looking for, 2,000. And then I can make this thing work. I think I'll make that a... And I would also go in and maybe even file that little pin so that it was just touching that one tooth. We'll have to see if we can modify that. Again, here's what's happened. Nobody, do, nobody does this anymore. There's no professional market left. There are no saw sharpeners where people are taking their hand, dropping their hand saws off to be sharpened. So when there's no demand, there's not going to be a supply and it's not like people are banging on the door wanting to learn how to sharpen their saws. So, you know, who's going to go out there and supply stuff for uh, such a small market? Dilemma. Next, Frick. Okay. TC in Spokane, Washington. Hi, TC. How often should, be you, how often should you be sharpening a saw? Example, your dovetail saw. Well... Um, that question really doesn't have an answer. And it would be like saying, how often do I need to put gas in my tank? Well, when it's out. Now, what I can answer is, when is the saw not, when does the saw need to be sharpened? Well, it needs to be sharpened when it no longer cuts aggressively. Oh, how do you know if it cuts aggressively? Well, if you had it new, then you knew how fast it cut. And if that was... 
10 strokes to get there and now it's taking me 20, then I probably could stand to have a sharpening. And you'll, you, and the other thing too is you can see it. When you can actually see the points, they just show up as shiny dull spots, then it's time to, it's time to be sharpened. But um, I always, it's interesting whenever somebody was, I was trying to sell them a saw, they always say, well, uh, how often, how do you sharpen it? And I always told them, I said, get it dull first. And by the time you've dulled it, you'll know enough about it. You'll be able to sharpen it. I say that only because you could probably go years between sharpenings. Think about it. You cut a row of dovetails. You really haven't cut that many inches of wood. So it's not something that's going to need to be sharpened every few months. I, I pretty much guarantee you that. And I'm sorry, I can't reach through the camera and show you or have you feel a sharp saw versus a dull saw. But just uh, in recapping, watch for the shiny tops of the points. When you can see the tops, of, when you can see the edge, then you know it's dull. And when it just, it's just not biting, it's not, doesn't feel aggressive in the wood, then it needs to. And the other one too you can do is by touching it. When, you run, when I run my fingers across a sharp saw, it really grabs. If it's dull, it doesn't. And then you have blood all over your hand. Right, Frick? That's right. How do you know when your chisel is sharp, Frick? When it goes right through to the bone. Right to the bone. It means it's not sharp enough. Should have taken the whole thing. Next. <laughs> Uh, Jim Pearson in Saranac Lake, New York. Hi, Jim. Where's that, Jake? It's near Lake Placid. Okay, he says, would you discuss the art of saw tensioning? Some old saws require a little hammering to take out a permanent bend and then need some tensioning. But to what exactly does tensioning do? You know what, Jim? I don't know. I read about it, and... I t and uh, you know, there, there was a big debate. In fact, there, this is going to be the topic in our uh, next newsletter on a folded brass back versus this. And they say, oh, the tensioning, blah, blah, blah. You know what? I, this, we make these, we, we mill a slot 20 <coughs> thou wide down through a piece of brass. We set that blade in there. It's glued in place with Loctite. To secure it, we drill and peen four copper pins. But there is no tensioning. I, 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 uh, I've heard about this. I've read about it. I've never done it. I can't answer it. I know they do it on circular blades, on saws as well. Maybe not so much now as they used to. I don't know. I think anybody does it with carbide blades. But as far as needing tension or anything like that on a dovetail saw, this will slice through the wood as fast as you can control it. And blah, blah. I, I, will, I, I meant to say this earlier. They talk about... Um, saws that have uh, that are taper ground, meaning the saw blade is thicker here than it is here. And I don't know why they bother to do that and go through all the extra effort to grind these saws when that same thing can happen with the set. And the saw works. Remember, these are break. These saws are for design for breaking down lumber. They're not for making a joint. So I I just uh, I don't get it. They work fine the way they are. Sorry, I didn't answer your question, but I can't because I've never done it, and I, but I have yet to find a reason why it needs to be done. Might have been an old timer thing when they did them that way. The brass back was folded and hammered, but I can't tell you why. Sorry. Next, Frick. Uh, Dean Clark in Edmonton. Dean in Edmonton. Yes. He says, all the quote-unquote old guys around here claim you are wasting your time sharpening if the saw is not over 20 years old due to garbage metal in current saws. What are your thoughts on that? Old guys. It's funny that uh, how, how things get misconstrued. Um... I would take a, a modern chisel over an old chisel anytime. I think that it's the manufacturer. You can buy junk, you can buy really good stuff. Don't expect them to be the same price. So I'm sure back then there was junk, 
And back then there were good things, good saws. And today, same thing. You can get junk and you can get a good saw, although it's getting harder to find good saws. So I can't buy into that. I sometimes think old guys just like to have things to talk about, make reference to how good it was in the old days. Are you an old guy? I'm getting there. <laughs> hey, uh, give me a break for a second. I want to ask your opinion of something. So um, Jake and I have been working on this. I'm, uh, I'm about to start offering um, custom chisel sets where I turn the handles out of something really pretty. These ones, thanks to Nick here in New Brunswick, these ones are made out of uh, maple burl. And I didn't want to send them out in just a regular old cardboard tube. I wanted it to be a presentation case. I'm just curious, I'd, I'd like to have your feedback. So here's what we, the first idea. So this is made out of walnut, finger jointed. Um, it, it, it's designed on the back, up underneath here is for a French cleat. So I put my cleat on the wall and I come over and I set this on there and drop it down on the French cleat. We'll have another little strip of wood that'll come with it that will go, we'll screw to the wall up here so that this cannot come off accidentally. The idea was to have an appropriate presentation case for a really nice set of chisels, but also to leave the option for it to be used as either your, your display holding case on the wall, or some people just like to be able to keep their, two, their chisels in a box. They take them out, they put them back. So what we did, show you this. So this, this piece of walnut, we bored holes almost to the surface and we inserted magnets. So the magnet is sitting right there. It, it uh, more than enough to hold the chisels, so they don't fall out. We got a 7 8 inch diameter hole down there that holds the end of the chisel. Um, what we did here is we, and we will probably fill these, we drilled four quarter inch deep holes that go almost to the end and then we inserted quarter inch magnets. So we didn't, I didn't want the lid to leave any scar on the box. So I didn't want hinges, I didn't want screw holes. So remember this is just messing around at this point. So on the lid we have four uh, quarter inch magnets. So when you set that on there, there's a little rabbit to keep it from sliding forward and back or this way. And the, mag the magnets hold well enough that this does not fall off. Little finger recess in there in order to lift it up. Now, if you're hanging them on the wall and this is gonna become your permanent chisel storage, then you have no use for this. If you want it as a means of saving your chisels in a box, well then that's what you can you get. Now Jake had a good idea. I don't like the plywood look, but you can't do this with a solid piece of wood. It's just not going to stay flat. So what I think we're going to do is this is going to be maple and this is going to be maple. This will be walnut, this will be walnut, and this because it's Baltic birch and it comes in the color of maple. So you'll have maple going all the way up and over and down and it'll really show off your joint much nicer. Just tell me what you think of that. They hate as far it. As, they hate it? <laughs> no. Beautiful is the most uh, common word being thrown around. Well, I like the idea. We spent some time on it. I, had, I got some input from some friends. Luther had his two cents worth. But, um, yeah. If you think of a way to improve it or make it more useful, let me know. All right, Frick, next. All right, next one. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. We're supposed to be giving a shout-out to any... So if you're a combat wounded vet that has been in our... that has come to one of our classes and you're on tonight, I'd love to give you a shout-out. So if you'll put in the in the comment section, if you put at Ken and your name, and if you can remember the class you were in, we'll give you a shout out. Ken, have you noticed any? Uh, <coughs> I forgot. I usually mention this at the beginning. You already mentioned Kevin Burks. Kev's on. Super Dave's on. Super Dave's on. Jack Wayne. The goat. Jack's on. And so Dave. so hold on a second. So Jack's. Jack's great granddaughter was born two weeks ago. Probably three now. Three weeks ago, and she weighs. She just I think a four, fourteen ounces. She just hit a pound. She just hit a pound. This is an itty bitty baby. 
She's still alive, and she's in, obviously in... 10 inches, 11 inches. 11 inches long? Yeah. Well, I remember seeing the picture. She was just about the length of her hand. So we've, uh, we've all been praying for this little girl. So, Jack, give us an update in the chat if you can, and, and do the same thing at Ken, and then Ken will uh, fill us in. Jack's coming up for the class in May, and so is uh, Jim Rossetti's going to be here. So there'll be a big meeting of the Bench Brigade Minds. Anybody else, Ken? Uh, Sue B. Ah, Sue. We're coming to Florida. I just don't know when. That's it. So if you're combat wounded vets, please speak up so we can recognize you. And I'd love to, uh, I'd love to reconnect. Frick, switch first. Switch cameras. Jake getting tired? Yeah, probably. Phil, Phil Lawrence is on. Phil, hey, Phil. Glad you're here. Go <laughs> ahead, Frick. Next question. Okay, next one comes from David Moore in Austin, Texas. Hey, David. Do I need a collection of files for small dovetail saws versus large panel saws? Yeah, you're not going to use... Well, you, you've got to... Uh, your file... I think what they suggest is about a third of the file actually in the tooth. So if you're going to file a, a, a rip tooth at 7 TPI, you're going to need a file bigger than that. So yeah, you'll need a few. We'll uh, we'll try to carry we'll try to carry saws for all of that files for all of that if the ones we got we've got coming actually pan out and end up being good ones. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed because I'm running out of the few good ones I have left. Next, Frick. Just as a suggestion on the uh, chisel box, Dave uh, Weber Weber. Said, Dave up in Ontario? Yeah, he says he, hey, lo Dave. he loves it, but he would like you to find a way to display the lid above the box when it's hung on the wall. And a couple of people said that was a great idea. To display the lid. And we also want to display the lid. Well, you know what? The lid could be what's... The lid could be uh, neatly screwed to the wall, and that could be what's what keeps the box from lifting up. So the problem with a French cleat is that if in pulling out your chisels, you accidentally lift it up too hard, you may knock it off the wall. So we need to have something sitting up on top that will allow, won't allow it to lift up. So we could easily do that with the lid. That's actually a good idea, Dave. That's what Jack says about the little girl. Okay, so here's, her name is Stella. Stella's really doing well for being so small. No major setbacks and signs, improve, signs of improvement every day. She's all dressed up for Easter right now. <laughs> It'd be great if you could post a picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm look, working on it. All right. Little Stella. Stella! Jack, do your impression of uh, Elaine calling Stella. No, better than that, come up and do your uh, impression of Elaine dancing. <laughs> Next, Rick. Uh, okay. A second here. Working on the picture. Stella. Uh, Kevin Windsor in Bethel, Maine. Hey, Kevin. He says, should a novice attempt to sharpen a dovetail saw? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't be afraid. But I, I, as, as Jake said, go to the hardware. You can buy a $15 Stanley. Practice on that. It, it won't take you long to get good at it. It's really easy. Very, very easy. Once you've done it, you'll say, oh, my goodness, I was worried about that. You can make your vise, and you can, uh, the files are not expensive if you can find one. And popsicle stick. But go in and watch Tom Law's video. Get access to it somewhere. And it's a great video for instructing on how to sharpen a saw. It really is good. I wish I'd had a chance to meet him before he died, but I, unfortunately I didn't. Next, Frick. Um. You don't try, you'll never know. And by the way, we will sharpen it for you if you insist, but I really th think people should uh, just bite the bullet and do it. And besides, if you screw it up, we'll sell you another one. Saw. All right, Declan Barrett in Vancouver Island. Hi, Declan. He says, is it better to buy cheaper saws for a school wood workshop or just, and just replace or go expensive and maintain? Uh, well, uh, I never encourage anybody to go cheap. 
because cheap comes with a terrible price, and the price is the, uh, the disappointment and the discouragement that it causes. Cheap tools are not cheap, because if you're serious about it, and you get past the, disappointing, the disappointment that they in, incur, induce, you're eventually going to have to want to replace it because you realize it's a piece of junk. However, you're in a school setting. And that means that uh, people that don't always know how to take care of things are going to have access to your tools. Well, that's a tough one. Um... You know, I'm thinking, would, would, I want, would I want you buying 15 of my dovetail saws and putting them in a, in a high school shop or even a, ju a junior high shop? The hand, it gets dropped and the handles are going to break. The same thing's going to happen with a wood saw, a wood-handled saw. They're going to get uh, brutalized. Uh, you know what? I don't. I can't even answer that. I, I know. I'll give you a few ideas that are a little bit unrelated. Um, one of the schools in Ontario or Alberta, I can't remember which, but the instructor had a really good idea. So what typically happens in a in a school woodworking program is, kid comes in, he needs a plane, he goes over to the tool crib and he pulls out every one and finds one that's sharp, uses it and returns it in terrible condition, instead of learning how to sharpen. Well, nobody wants to uh, spend the first 45 minutes of their class fixing the tool that somebody else brutalized the uh, day before. So he didn't have the budget to have, ideally, everybody that takes the class has their own set of tools that is checked out to them for the semester, and they're responsible to keep them in good operating order. But he... Couldn't afford to do that. So what he did is he, everybody had their own blade and chip breaker, which is a small fraction of the cost. And uh, he had a little tray with little slots. And at the end of the class, you took your blade chip breaker out of the plane and you put it in the slot with your name on it. So when you came back the next class, at least your blade and chip breaker were in the condition that you left them, which I thought was smart. Um, I have sold my saws to schools. And what they typically do is... The instructor keeps them under lock and key, and there are students that there are students that have proven that they can handle good tools, and they get checked out to them. But for the kid who's there just because it seemed like an easy class to take, and they drop their stuff and they have no no care or caution with them, they use the uh, the stuff that if it gets destroyed, you're not out two hundred and fifty dollars. Hate to say that, but same reason I don't want people coming in and using my tools. I take care of them. Next, Rick. I'm just going to show a picture of uh, Stella on the screen. Stella! There she is, little Stella. You got a picture? Yep, it's on the screen. She's a little tiny thing. Yeah, very tiny. Fighter. Born under a pound. She was 20, 20 how many weeks? 22, I think. 22 weeks. 22 weeks. Okay, next question uh, comes from John Hennick in Michigan. Hi, John. And he says, uh, I have a lot of hand saws that I picked up over the years. They are dull and would like to sharpen them and use if possible. Are there different sharpening techniques for different saw types? Yeah, we, we've answered that. A lot of these questions are very similar. Yeah. I'll say it again. Get access to Tom Law's saw, the video is titled Saw Sharpening with Tom Law. And uh, it's, it's worth whatever it costs to get. And it's easy to follow and he's a, good inst he's a good instructor and he makes it really simple and it'll just be, you'll think it's great. Tom Law Saw Sharpening. If you can get, if you can find Ian Kirby's book entitled Down to a Line, that's an excellent book for more reasons than just his information on sharpening. But um, you might have a hard time finding that one. Ian is still around. I think he's in his early 80s. Next, Rick. Tyson Underwood in Mill Valley, California. Hey, Tyson. He says, how fast can you sharpen a saw? Uh, well, if you're talking about a dovetail saw, it probably takes seven minutes, Jake. Yeah. Seven minutes. It, it doesn't take long. 
But so I don't let them get really dull. I get them. I I I sharpen them when it takes approximately one stroke. So each tooth is getting one stroke. One stroke. One stroke. One stroke. One stroke. So set up time. Save yourself ten, ten minutes for the whole process. Now, if you've got a, now, uh, I'll throw this in there too. So you probably are going to need to reset the teeth after every third or fourth sharpening because remember, uh, your your it's only your tooth is bent like that, and every time you file it, you shorten it. So the top of your tooth was here, at, and at this point you had two thou set, and the next time you filed it, it's here. So maybe you're down to a thou and a half set. Remember, because your tooth is getting shorter, but the bent part was here. That doesn't change. And eventually when you're down to here, there's hardly any set at all. So you've got to go in and reset them. But that could, that could be six to eight years from now, unless you're cutting dovetails every day. I haven't met anybody who does. Next, Rick. Uh, next one. Oh, just a reminder for everybody to hit the like button. We have 626 viewers and only 285 likes. So if you could hit that like button. Helps us. So maybe they don't like it. Well, maybe not. Then they should leave. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't Is go. there a leave button? Please don't go. Uh, that's, a, that's a song. It's that X up in the right-hand corner. <laughs> I, I'll tell you something else. If you're, I imagine these people already are. But if you're not on our newsletter, and it's not a, uh, our newsletter is not a marketing newsletter. It's an information newsletter. So there's a different topic and this month's, next, next month is all about um, back saws, folded back versus solid back. And there's always a video, and then Luther's always got an article or two. So it's, and we always, we do ever actually, anytime we have uh, sales, uh, sales new anytime products. we have new products, seconds, meaning somebody, Ian screws up making a saw and puts a little ding on something, still works perfectly, but. We don't, can't sell it as a first. That all goes out to people in the newsletter. So any page on our website, you can sign up for the newsletter. Do that. It'll serve you well. And you also get the notifications of our live episodes. And a lot of people, if you're wondering where these questions are coming from, because you're not seeing them in the chat, when we send out the notification for the live, there is a link there to submit your questions beforehand. So that's where all these questions yeah. are coming from. Yeah, we give preference. We, give, we treat our newsletter as... These are our, these are our most dedicated followers. So we answer their questions first. They get preferential treatment, and I'm welcoming you to join it. So, all right. Question from Adam Knott in Devon, UK. Not Adam. Adam Knott. Is there any advantage in adding slope to crosscut filing? Is uh, is there any advantage to adding slope? To crosscut filing. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he means. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I'm not following his what, what he's asking. If he could, if he has a chance to re restate it, see if you can find it. Go on to the next one, please. Yeah, I'm trying to find one that we haven't kind of. Uh, Timothy in Florida South. How fine a pitch? Hey, how fine a pitch can you sharpen? I think some other quote unquote expert says sixteen TPI is the max. What is your take? Well, it it all has to do with your file. It depends on how good your file is, how pointed your file. Is. If your if your file's not pointed enough, yeah, you're going to wipe anything out uh, when you get up in the high number. But I think you can do twenty two. Just have to have a light touch. I haven't done this, but um, you can buy you can buy triangular files that are uh, diamond or uh, CBN. Is it CBN, Jake? Yeah. So that that file is a diamond file. I've destroyed it, by the way, and that's got that same coating that the diamond plate that we sell has on it. So you could go in and do it with that. That's that one is rote. That would allow you to do something even finer. Take a little bit longer because it certainly is not going to cut as aggressively as a regular file does. Next, Rick. 
Paul Pinto in Colorado. Hi, Paul. He's got two questions. Here's the first one. Crosscut saws appear more difficult to sharpen. Do you sharpen crosscut saws, and can you show us how to do this? Um, I've only done a few of them, my own. Uh, somebody sends us a crosscut saw to be resharpened. We usually just replace the blade. And can I show you how? Um, well, let's put my, I, I wish I had my, uh, my bigger vise, but I don't, but we can do this. And yes, you're right, it is a little more difficult. So here's my, here's my, how many teeth is this, Jake, 12? The big panel saw, yeah. Yeah. So I've got that so that the teeth are just an eighth of an inch or so above. And you'd have to go in there and paint them. With a, with a Sharpie or a marker. So you can tell where you've worked. I'm not going to do the whole thing. And then put your eyes on. Get some light. Now, you're gonna set that in there and let the, let the gullet dictate where, so let me get 60 degrees. If I can just get a, a reference, I can go from there. Go the other way. So, skip, 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 skip. Does it matter? Does it matter that your file isn't perpendicular? No. And then I turn this around. I turn this around. Jake, can you uh, put something in that block of wood right there? Lift it up. Lift it up. Where to finish off? Give me my reference again. There. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. And on you go. You got to do it half from one side, half from the other side. And you can tell when they're sharp because you feel the points. Now. Now I gotta go do the whole saw. But that's all right, I did it for you. Next question, Frick. So the second question he had was, I have two saws with progressive tooth patterns. How do you sharpen these? Uh, progressive tooth meaning each tooth is getting, each tooth is getting bigger or each tooth, they're changing the pitch. Doesn't say. I would think if it's changing the pitch, it's gonna be a little more difficult because that means you're gonna be holding your file at a different angle on each one. I would assume it's that progressive. If it's a, uh, if the one that Lee Nielsen sells. If it's just a matter that the tooth is getting bigger as you go down, that shouldn't make much of a difference at all. Um, and don't be overly aggressive too. I mean, you you want to 
enough pressure that you can feel the soft bite, but you don't need to uh, you don't need to go at it like a madman. So I don't think there'd be much of a difference. I don't have any I don't have any uh, saws with progressive pitch, but if it's just a matter of a, a tooth count getting bigger or smaller, I don't think there'd be any difference. If it's a matter of changing the pitch, then you're going to have to adjust with each one. Just get to the point where you can set the file in the gullet and just adopt that angle and then somehow have your finger referencing on the edge of the file so that you know you're not tipping it one way or the other. Try it. Next, Rick. All right, next one comes from uh, Jerry Gillette in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Hey, Jerry. He says, how do you correct a saw that pulls or steers itself to either on side or the one side or the other? In particular, a rip saw. Can this be from uneven set in the teeth? Yeah. So that we addressed that a little earlier, Jerry, that you may have asked your question earlier. So that's just a matter of going in and addressing the set. If, we, if one side of the saw has more set than the other, though, so your teeth look like this, if one saw the teeth are sticking way out like that, the saw is going to want to follow the path of least resistance. So it's going to go toward the heavy set, and you're going to get that arcing like this. How do you fix it? Well, if, it's, if there's too much set overall, then you're going to remove set, and if it's not an, and otherwise, you're going to, let me say that again. If, if it's got too much set, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to back the set off of the side that's got too much. Or the other option is to increase the set on the side that doesn't have enough. If that makes sense, hopefully. Your set needs to be even on both sides. And the easiest way to do it, I'll show you that again, if it's on something like a tendon saw or a dovetail saw. So if my saw was drifting to my left like that, then this, saw, this side has the excess set. So I would take my diamond plate, diamond plate because it can stand with the abuse, whereas it's going to wear your water stones or your ceramic stones quite a bit. Now, I'm not going to do this for real, so I'm going to pretend that this piece of wood is my, my stone. So remember, this is the side that's the offender. I'm going to set it on here like this. My thumb's going to keep the appropriate amount of pressure, and I'm going to drag the saw like this. I only do it once, and go over, and I'm going to make a test cut. I might make two or three test cuts. And if I'm still getting a little bit too much drift, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to drag it across like that, and I'm just taking, all I'm doing is just, if you can imagine, those points are sticking out a little bit too far, and I'm just filing them down a little bit so they're not out as far, and you'll eventually get it just right. Now, if you go too far, you take off too much set and it binds, well, then you got to start all over, reset the teeth, do it again. Don't expect to get it perfect the first time you do it. Who do you think you are, Frick? Next, Frick. Uh, Tom in Seattle, what back saws Hi, do I need for cutting dovetails versus cutting tenon shoulders? Can I get away with one saw? Uh, say that again, please. What back saws do I need for cutting dovetails versus cutting tenon ten shoulders? Can I get away with one saw? What back saw should I get? Do I need? Do I need? For cutting dovetails? For cutting dovetails. Versus cutting tenon shoulders? Versus cutting tenon shoulders. Can I get away with one? Well... The difference typically between a dovetail saw and a tenon saw is going to be the size of the tooth. So with narrow set, remember I showed you this? Let's go back over here. So with narrow set, and this is narrow set, meaning, you know, there's no slop. So as the tooth is cutting wood, these gullets or the space between the points fills up with the sawdust until it gets out here and it pukes it out. So the deeper the gullet, the faster it's going to cut because if, if uh, it's a really small tooth, a quarter, of an, a quarter of an inch in, the gullet's full, it can't cut anymore. That's going to slow down your cutting. If you had deeper teeth, well, that would allow for a faster cut. So the tenon saw, which typically on the tenon, I'm cutting thicknesses I'm cutting in this direction, so that's a pretty long cut. On dovetails, I'm typically cutting in this direction. 
So dovetails, you can get away with smaller teeth, which is going to give you a little more control. Doesn't have to take as much to push it. And it's, it's going to be just a, a finer cut. So one saw, well, here, let's try this. I have, uh, I have two tenon saws. I have my big one and I have my medium tenon. The difference is the um, capacity underneath the brass. So you can see how much of a difference there is. I could cut dovetails with this. Cuts fast. It's got a heavier kerf. The plate is 25 thou versus this one, which is 20 thou. I prefer my dovetail. In order for a tenon saw where you're going to have a fairly deep cut, you have to have a lot more blade underneath the brass back. So you're just, it's just a little bit wobbly this way, as I said, if you, especially if you're not doing it a lot. So dovetails, typically you're not going much more than three quarters of an inch, so you don't have to have as much depth here. And that allows you, me anyway to be more precise. And then with that new one, our, uh, our new three quarter dovetail, which is even finer still. I like, I, the reason we made this is for doing things like jewelry boxes where you're dealing with very thin wood. Now this one is 15 thou plate, 22 TPI. And just the fact that it's so small, it allows you to go in there and be extremely precise. but a little undersized when you're doing dovetails in a, in a big carcass. So the question is, is there one you can get away with? <coughs> well, if you're only going to buy one, I would probably suggest the medium tenon would be the one. But you gotta remember when it yeah. comes to joinery, your saw is the make or break. The better your saw, the better chance you're going to have of being able to cut that joint and assemble it right from the saw. And that's what you want. If you're having, if your sawing is off to the point where you've got to go in and reshape those tails with the chisel and reshape the pin and pair a little here and pair a little there, not only is it going to quadruple the amount of time it takes, but I can pretty much guarantee the minute you start touching those sides with a chisel, the accuracy of your joint is going to go out the window. So it's not a good idea to scrimp when it comes to those types of tools. Now, of course, you expect that from me because I make dovetail saws, but I also make great dovetailers. And there's quite a few people that could speak up and say that. And that's a combination of some good instruction, but even more importantly, a good saw, a saw that actually does the job. Now, I've, I've avoided doing this, so let me show you right now. When I mean a good saw, take this out. I'll take my dovetail saw, which is the most popular one we sell, and I'm going to take this piece of... Just snap the end off of this real quick. Okay, so here's your test that will tell you whether or not your saw is as good as it needs to be. Take a piece of wood, fairly thick, hardwood, softwood, whatever. Take your dovetail saw, come in about oh, half an inch or so and make a cut. And make that cut as deep as your saw will go. Then turn it on its side and remove that piece. Okay. Now a good glue joint comes when you have two mating surfaces that are smooth and in this case flat. So the smoother and the flatter these surfaces are, the better will be the joint. So the test you want to do is put it back together 
and see how good the joint is. Now flip it around so that you're not matching grooves, just in case, and see how good the joint is. Or then you can take it like this and set it like that and see how good the joint is. That comes right from the saw. Do you know how much time that saves? If you don't have to go in with a chisel and start trying to pare that and you're fighting the grain direction and pieces of wood are flying off in all directions, that is what you want from your saw. That is the saw doing its job. Your job is the layout and aiming the saw. I've got to, I've got to caution you about this. So when you're dovetailing and you start on this angle, you can't make a correction part way through. You are committed. So it's going to continue on that angle. If it was off, too bad. You either got to start over or live with it. So you have to learn to aim your saw at the angle that you want. Okay. Besides that, you wouldn't want to be able to current turn it because if you did, how are you ever going to get a piece? How are you ever going to get a pin to come up against that if that surface is not flat? That has to be flat. Your job is to start it and aim it. We can put those little teeth up front so that you can start it easily and a little bit of practice will get you heading in the right direction. Next, Rick, I'm watching the clock. Well, actually, uh, Jacqueline sent us a two-minute video of Austin's bench being delivered, so I think we should end Oh, with that would be good. So let me just, uh, let me introduce this. Um, so Jack, it's probably coming up in two years. Jack begged me to let him head up our bench brigade. And I'll just take 30 seconds and explain to you what happened. I woke up one night and thought, oh, my goodness. Here we bring these guys in, we teach them, we give them all the tools, and they go home, and they don't have a bench to work on. So I started calling some of the vets that had been to our program, and sure enough, they hadn't done anything since they'd left here because they didn't have a bench. I said, I was just too busy to be able to take this on. And somehow Jack caught wind of that and contacted me and said, Rob, let me do this. So Jack has done it, and he has done a fantastic job. He arranges it so that... If at all possible, the individual who makes the, the bench, and the, the benches are built by civilian volunteers, they procure all the materials, we send them the vice and the bench dogs, they build it to our specs, we provide them with the information, and then Jack tries to arrange it so that they can actually go and deliver it in person directly to the vet and make that uh, human connection. So Jack has been a godsend for us because so many of these vets would not be able to do what they do had it not been for Jack and Chris Chahusky who helps him make arrangements for shipping and now Jim Rossetti who's taken it upon himself to commit to building us 10 benches um, every year with his group, the Kodiak Woodworkers up in just outside of Moncton, New Brunswick. So um, Austin uh, is a uh, Navy Se retired Navy SEAL was injured in a parachute accident, but that left him paralyzed from the waist down. And um, the guy in Alberta, whose name is... It's on the video, if you forget. It's on the video. My daughter, Loren, stopped in and made him some cookies. He's done two benches for us. I apologize for not remembering his name. It'll come to me. He did one for... Uh, for... Uh, uh, Josh... Josh Brian out in BC and delivered it, and I think it was a 10 hour drive. And then he's also an architect, so he designed this bench specifically for Austin. And I'll let you see it, and I won't say any more. All right, hopefully this works, because he just sent it to me. And
much we, we talked about, so we'll see. Oh, it's like, it's perfect. What's your altar? Camera's on. The, no, yeah, this one no, here? Yeah. Jack, that was beautiful. Congratulations, Austin. Wear that thing out. That was great to see. I wish we had that type of, uh, that type of presentation for all the ones that have happened. Big, huge thank you to uh, Dave Anderson out in Ontario and all the Bench Brigade. You, you really complete the, uh, the mission that we're trying to accomplish. So couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Austin, for your sacrifice. I talked to Austin not that long ago. Okay, so, are you done? Yep, yep. So our donations are around seventeen hundred. So if you just want to introduce the prizes once okay. more, then we'll do. Okay. What the draw. did we do last time, Kevin's? Let's do one of Jeff's this time. So let's do. Uh, I don't think we've given away a kiss kiss stick. Yeah. I, uh, huh? Let's do a kiss. Let's do a, an Irish kiss stick. <laughs> A, a, a Jeff O'Connor, or as Luther would call him, Jeff, Jeff O'Connor, Irish kiss dick. Well, first of all, we got to give away three dead cats. So all let's right. give away the three dead cats. We're ready. First dead cat winner is Clive Buckingham in Queensland, Australia. Clyde or Clive? Clive. Clive? Clive. Yeah. Uh, why do... We talked to him recently? Yeah. Well, if you remember, tell me. But th congratulations, Clive. Dead cats do beautiful in, in the uh, wet weather that you have in the UK. Okay, winner number two is Michael McDonald in New York. Michael, you'll appreciate that spring and summer and fall and winter. And dead cat number three is going to Mel Sherritt. Somewhere what? in Canada. It doesn't say where specifically. But. Oh, Mel, you'll wear yours 11 months out of the year. <laughs> now our grand prize of a uh, Jeff O'Connor Irish kiss stick. And it is going to... This is the first one we've ever given away. Saren Stewart in Alberta. Saren Stewart. Saren. Saren. S-U-R-R-A-N. I'm relying on Frick. Congratulations. <laughs> Keep it close. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. How many did we have on? What was our maximum tonight? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, around 670. Yeah, around 670. Okay. So we are about a month away. Actually, what's the date today, anyone? 16th. 16th. So we are exactly a month away from the start of our first class. And we will do some live. Uh, we may do more than one some live sessions when the guys are here and we'll go around and interview them and we are excited about it. You most, should be too. Most of our content from the live sessions will probably be on Instagram. So make sure you follow us on there. Oh as well. yeah. So yeah. So if you haven't, you haven't, yeah. How do they find us? So I have it down the corner. Uh, you can search for Rob Cosman hand tool woodworking in Instagram, or you could, we have a shortcut Instagram.robcosman.com and it'll take you right to the link. So make sure you follow us there. Lots of content all week. All right. Happy. Jack says that Clive is one of our Bench Brigade members. Oh, really? Oh, well, thank you, Clive. It's great. Um, happy Easter, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for your support. See you.